Okay, uh, we are now recording. I'm just doing a quick time screen record. Um, um, so I have not thought through exactly how to um, teach or demonstrate this stuff. Most of the demonstrations we have of CES are in the form of the web-based um, uh, that, that, that guess the code challenge page. Um, but let's see what we can start with. So cloning the repository is a good first step. Um, the most recent commit happens to be the most recent release that we made a couple of days ago. So uh, we're already sitting on a release tag and we don't have any sort of um, uh, stuff that's sitting on trunk that hasn't had a chance to bake very much. Um, npm install gets you everything that SES depends upon. From here, a reasonable way uh, to get started, I think, um, uh, oh, right. Um, if you're, uh, if sorry. You're, uh, Excuse me. Um, yeah. So no dash R E S M. What does that do? <laughs> um, the E S M specifically part. Yeah. So that is um, a it, it. Bradley, you can tell me if I'm getting this right. It adds a module. I don't loader. think Bradley's oh, not. Sorry. Um, it adds a module loader to Node that tells it that as you load modules, um, the, the module loader that it's injecting in there as a plugin knows how to handle ES6 modules. So it knows how to handle import and export statements. Whereas okay. without yeah, I was that, trying to do that with experimental modules, but it didn't seem to work. So that's yeah. likely what I was missing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, th I think that Node um, is slowly acquiring that functionality natively, but it's still behind a switch like that. And ESM is a, a plugin that we've been using that seems reasonably popular for this purpose. Um, um, so, um, a quick question, though. So, you're just using the ESM plugin as is. You're not. You're not affecting it in any way because. Right. Um, yeah. So, so, so far with with that command line, you should be able to get uh, experimental modules running, um, a parallel to what you're getting with Node. Dash R. Okay. Um, but uh, the only problem you will probably run into is uh, when you use experimental modules, any ES code that gets um, uh, loaded as a module has to actually run either through a uh, uh, dash dash loader to be uh, baked or actually has to uh, be the source code already baked with whatever changes you're making to the source. So we could explore if we if, if you guys want to support experimental modules in Node, um, although it's it's about to be deprecated. Oh, what are they intending to replace it with? Well, as soon as the final um, uh, loader design, which is phase three, which is the next phase about to begin, as soon as that is um, uh, agreed upon, uh, and I think we agreed upon the harder parts so far. So so as soon as that part um, is uh, there. I, I think it will start to actually deprecate uh, experimental modules uh, on on the master branch. Hmm, okay. So, but, but could be six months. So, like, hopefully less, but it could be six months. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah, it'd be great if this thing worked with uh, whatever Node's built-in stuff is. Um, the the yeah. SAS environment does not have a module loader yet, so the only thing you can load into it is um, our our static strings with an evaluate command. All right. Um, so before we can roll out a module loader in there, before this is really useful for larger amounts of code, then we'll have to have support like that in there. Um, I'll be happy to help with that if the yeah. time comes. Right That'd be great. Thank you. Thank yeah, you very that, much. That would be wonderful. Yeah. Um, so let's see, if you're getting this from source, from a git checkout, then you have to do the git submodule update dash dash init command to populate the subdirectory called proposal realms, which is just grabbing a specific um, commit, so specific revision of the uh, TC39 proposal realms repository. That's right. What's the command again? 
get submodule update dash dash init. Okay, got it. And if you were using SES as a dependency, then uh, you wouldn't need to do this. You know, in your other application, you say npm install ses, and that will grab um, the tarball in which this thing has already been created. Okay. Is, are we up to date on that npm? Uh, yes. Yes, okay. I published a new version of, to npm a couple days ago. Great. Um, Terrific. And so then from here, let's see. That works. So we can make our new realm like that. Um, and then this is taking expression syntax. Uh, evaluate takes expression syntax? I don't know. Uh, do open curly, close curly. Yeah, it's, um, that one won't tell us one way or the other, probably. Uh, do open paren, open curly, close curly, close paren. Um, like this? Yep. Okay. Uh, and then do the same thing with the semicolon at the end. Yeah. Evaluate is not taking expression syntax. Okay. It's taking um, uh, uh, either program or function body syntax. Right, okay, which is why I have to do this to get back the foo. Right. Yep. Um, so that's the basic way of, uh, if, you can, if you can take your function and turn it into a string and pass it into evaluate, then that's a way of, um, of implementing it. Uh, you could do something like depend on an endowment. Like that. So in this case, foo is defined to close over this b. The b is being provided um, from the caller, from the evaluate side. And this is a technique for uh, providing a, creating a trusted, um, a, a trusted proxy of some sort. So in this case, foo, no, not a proxy, a trusted thing. Um, and this thing is sitting in between the confined realm and the, the outer powerful realm. And the trusted thing is has access to something in the powerful realm because it's closed over one of these endowments. So basically, so, any names you pass into this object will be available as names to this function. So do we no longer have confine? Uh, we don't have a ses.confine. We didn't end up building that. Um, oh. we have, there's realm.confine, but we didn't uh, copy it over to ses. Okay. So, uh, sorry, I do have a question, uh, just catching up, very naive at that point. Uh, are, are you using uh, context from v VM, or are you actually um, baking and evaluating strings uh, against uh, proxy? When you create a root realm, uh, creating the root realm does, create, does use uh, VM create context to create a, a new primitive root realm, and then it does all the realm initialization inside of that um, uh, so that uh, it creates a, uh, the evaluator is using the width on a proxy trick. When you create a compartment within a root realm, um, uh, we're reusing the, you know, we're, we're staying within the same underlying um, uh, VM context uh, and just using the with on a proxy trick uh, to create uh, a different evaluation context within the same root realm. Okay, um, so so I, I just would like to follow up with that because about nine months ago I did try uh, to compare uh, uh, using VM context ver versus actually uh, you know um, replicating what the realm uh, shim does, uh, and there were potentially performance hazards in using VM context um, that that might be worth exploring. So, uh, I think it's, it's um, you know, uh, order of magnitudes lower relative to not creating an extra context. So um, in Node, uh, 
what's the I mean how do you not create an extra context well uh, if you really use the proxified object context of, of the width expression uh, you know that, that you evaluate the code in to make a compartment I believe um, if you use that pattern to design a virtual context, well, you, you, you don't um, like get a polyfill, like not a real secondary context. So you don't but, get a fresh set of primordials. You're just mm -hmm. seeing, seeing no, it. no, you don't. So, so, okay. so the, you know, like I'm, I'm really not not comparing all the trade offs. I'm okay. just, you know, it's just a matter of I okay. found that for some reason, obviously, we can see where Node can increase performance for a VM context. Uh, it's just something to keep in mind. It might have okay. been just temporary as well. Uh, when I was trying nine months ago. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. We d there is a, another version of SES that's in gestation, or a, a, a subset of SES. Let's call it a single, single root realm SES, um, mm -hmm. uh, which is um, uh, being done in a uh, Salesforce uh, repository, do, being done with us in a Salesforce created repository uh, that is not yet publicly available, but will be. Um, and uh, that one um, uh, just creates a, um, an, an S, basically creates and initializes an SES um, environment within the root realm that it starts in. Uh, it does not, it's, it's, um, it does not create a new root realm. Um, uh, and it does it so it's it's not shimming the full realm shim. It basically does not have a make root realm operation. Uh, the one of the motiv the motivation for it from our perspective, not from the Salesforce's perspective, is the XS JavaScript engine, which is a single root realm only JavaScript engine. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. Um, I, I think it's um, it's important to have both models give as much parity as possible. Uh, like I do a lot of work that goes from Node to the browser, and I tried workers and all of that. Um, and I found that um, with 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 this kind of uh, experimental harnessing of the runtime, it's it's always important to think of um, for porting it, like how it ports if you cannot really create a context which happens to be anywhere you don't have access to the internals of the runtime. Yeah, yeah the, pro the problem um, is that if you just, if you just use the um, uh, uh, initialize my own realm as a SES realm, uh, uh, one of the steps in that initialization is to freeze all the primordials. And within a browser frame, uh, that, that works. Uh, within the node default context, you know, the, the initial context that you that that you normally uh, use for everything in Node. Um, uh, apparently, if you freeze the primordials uh, of that default context, apparently some things break. But I have not investigated that myself. But that's why I was expecting to always create a new root realm, uh, a new you know, a new a new VM context for doing the SES work in Node rather than doing it in the main one. OK, uh, devil's advocate question. Uh, sorry, just the last one. Um, how about if every SES realm gets uh, proxified primordials, basically? So no, no SES realm actually gets the actual prim primordials, but then when it evaluates, if there is like a literal object or a literal array, um, like, like I'm, I'm just wondering, because I've seen people try to do that uh, with zones, for instance, so, uh, where, uh, but, but I, I, I see that there is a lot of places where you can miss particular instances. So, the, the, so one problem um, with uh, trying to membrane access to the primordials, and so I, I know that there is a, some project that, that did something like that. Maybe Alex um, knows more about that, but, but let me just raise the immediate problem that comes to mind is that some of the primordials are undeniable because they're reachable directly by syntax. Mm -hmm. So if you evaluate open square bracket, close square bracket, 
um, that's going to directly evaluate to an object that inherits from the original array.prototype. Uh, there's no way to, for without rewriting the source code, there's no way to force the result of evaluating that expression to be an object that inherits from a um, membrane, pro you know, membrane proxy um, shielding the original array that prototype. Sounds um, very, very convincing and actually kind of what I was feeling. So, uh, all right, thanks. Uh, okay, Mark asked me to weigh in here. Um, one classic example, just FYI, is uh, the own keys trap of any proxy handler or reflect. Um, that is always supposed to return an array, and in ES Membrane, I know of a bug where I haven't fixed yet um, wrapping that array that's returned in a proxy. Um, one of the reasons I can get away with it, but I haven't done it yet, is because it's going through a proxy. Um, to answer your question, Mark, about wrapping primordials, I have hard-coded a long list of primordials in ES Membrane. Um, and I'm not really happy with that solution, but hopefully Realms will provide that along the way somehow. And that's the best answer I can give. Okay. Um, so, so I, th I think the the you know the the bottom line is that um, uh, for what we're doing, um, uh, doing a membrane uh, shielding the primordials is not likely to be a, a viable approach. Um, and uh, even if it were, if the purpose of it is to avoid the overhead of creating a new VM context. Uh, I'm I'm very very sure uh, that um, uh, the performance would be a net negative. That the overhead of going through a membrane for all the primordials is going to lose you much much more than you gain by not creating a new uh, VM context. Yeah, uh, just the one thing to point though, the performance of, of evaluating code inside the context was slower. So I created everything. And I just ran a series of like big loops um, in, in one of the pre-made contexts versus a shim. Okay. And, and that loop took uh, like almost twice as much, uh, if not more, uh, like up to five times uh, when it was in a context. Huh. That's bizarre. Um, yeah. Was the loop accessing any global variables? Uh, oh, I've, I've made all sorts of like um, functions that wrapped that I then wrapped inside loops, and and so I tried a lot of different things. I I, I the details escape me at this point, mm -hmm. um, but I think maybe we could plan that down the road we do some sort of um, uh, uh, you know directed um, performance um, you know um, okay check. So um, I think. What we can do is we can provide feedback, especially through Bradley, to know that um, you know there's no reason for execution inside a created VM context. There's no 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 good reason for that to be slower than execution in the main context. Uh, so if it is slower, that's 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 an engineering problem that Node should fix. Absolutely. All right. Perfect. Okay. Okay. So. Um, uh, uh, JF has joined us since we started. Uh, JF, first of all, uh, warning that I ha that I am recording this session. I have an active recorder going, uh, and we're planning to publicly post this session. Um, okay, got it. Okay, uh, and also uh, explain to everyone that there's a um, single root realm CES repository. Uh, in process at Salesforce that's not yet publicly available. That is correct. We are working on it. It's a uh, it's a simplification of the realm uh, proposal, and uh, where we remove all mechanisms to use VM or iframe in order to create a new set of intrinsics. It's uh, tailored to 
what we need to do at Salesforce or what, how we have only one set of intrinsics for all uh, compartments and all, all realms, basically. And also, um, there was a need for an engine or a, a compartment engine that would work on platforms where creating a new set of intrinsics um, has no uh, mechanism, or at least the mechanisms are not using either VM or an iframe. Yeah, the, the XS virtual machine in particular only has one root realm that it starts with, and there's no mechanism for creating another. So am I right in thinking that compartments are sufficient for Jesse? Yes. Yes. As, okay. matter, as a matter of fact, Jesse doesn't actually need compartments uh, because Jesse actually has no concept of a global object. Okay. Uh, Jesse just needs a SES root realm. Uh, obviously, it needs one in which the primordials are frozen, but, but, but Jesse should not care... Um, whether there are whether um, multiple compartments are supported, right? Okay, thank you. It's kind of a question of in your application and however you're deploying this, can you get away with freezing the top level primordials or not? Yeah. So Jesse obviously assumes that you can. Well, I mean, Jesse is a language you would be evaluating in some environment. Mm -hmm. In that environment, what's that environment coming from? Is that Node? Is that a web context? Is that XS? Right. And so. You can use the compartment mechanism if you can afford to freeze all of the primordials from your environment. And then, and then whatever that case is, whatever mechanism by which you get an SES realm or, or compartment, you could evaluate Jesse inside that. No, but what, what I'm saying is, well, let's, say, let's take the XS case. Uh -huh. uh, in the XS case, we have, to create, we have to initialize that realm to be a full SES realm. And that... that that changes the entire environment of that excess of the program running excess. Right. So, so that gives us a root realm, mm -hmm. an SE, a proper SES root realm. Mm -hmm. As far as Jesse is concerned, we never need to make a compartment within that root realm. Uh, is another way of saying that is Jesse would be just as happy executing inside the um, the frozen XS top level realm as it would be inside a brand new realm or compartment made in some other environment. That's right. So, so um, yes. yeah, another environment where we have the full the, the full API, creating an SES root realm, and then just executing Jesse code in that root realm without ever creating compartments within that root realm, uh, is fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, and and par part of the reason is that um, the uh, sorry uh, Bradley just joined us. So uh, whenever somebody joins, the first thing I need to say is. Uh, Bradley, warning, we are recording this session uh, with the intent to publicly post the recording. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, so um, going back to the question, uh, so uh, part of the reason why Jesse doesn't need anything more than a root realm is all Jesse modules are pure modules. It's not, you're not, the rules of Jesse are such that you're not allowed to write a resource module. Okay. Um, uh, so, uh, Bradley, the, uh, the uh, oh, and JF, the overall agenda item right now that's, that's the reason why we're recording uh, is Brian is taking us through how to actually use the current uh, SES to, um, you know, to, you know how, how to create an SES root realm and how to use it to run programs. Um, I suppose the other thing to show is, so this is how endowments work. Um, the realm is created with a number of non-determinisms turned off by default. <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, so that gets us a NAND. If we made ourselves a different top level root realm, um, I think this is called uh, date now mode. Yeah. Allow. Yeah. So by default, the realm has all of the forms of non has all the non determinism turned off. Everything we've been able to think of. Um, and. Um, Another form of this is uh, math.random. So 
So that actually throws an exception. Uh, Date.now, we decided to have a return, not a number, because that seems to work better with modules like uh, moment.js, in which it is calling date.now during its initialization, even if nobody asks for it. And it doesn't do anything with the value. It's kind of a side effect of the way that it was written. So we can, we can cause less trauma, and you can get 90% 90, 90 of the functionality of moment uh, does not involve needing to know what the current time is. So you can get all of that functionality, even though we've turned off the non-determinism by having data now return not a number rather than throwing an exception. But for everything else, we decided it'd be best if this just returned an exception right away. Um, Through an exception. Uh, throws an exception. Um, so you can you can change this. You can say um, <coughs> math random mode. So if that's turned on, then your Realm has access to this source of non-determinism. Um, we have a similar thing for uh, internationalization. Um, is it number format? Yeah. Uh, and there's a switch to turn that on. The problem here is that the internationalization functions, uh, there are two or three of them that return or take advantage of the default locale that's been configured on your platform, which is going to come from some combination of environment variables that are set, things that are available uh, on disk, the way that node has been configured, or the way the browser has been configured. And that's not a term, we don't want things to behave differently in one place than another. So there's another switch to, uh, to turn these things back on again, if that's what you want. Yeah, and uh, part, part of what um, you know, th this isn't necessarily the, the um, final form of these configuration parameters, but part of the, what we're trying to achieve with this configuration is that uh, our requirements for a deterministic CES for replicated execution on blockchains is probably somewhat different than the Salesforce requirements uh, for a single route, for a... Um, uh, for assess uh, with regard to how strictly various things need to be turned off. Uh, so what we, we want to end up with, you know, one code base, but where the different requirements are configuration parameters rather than splitting the projects. You know, and there are situations where what you care, the, the main thing you're going to care about is protecting the host or protecting the other guests from this guest. So you need to prevent access to things that could be used to break out of confinement. But the second level goal that some environments have is to avoid any form of non-determinism. Um, so for the internationalization stuff, uh, intel.number format takes a locale name. And if you don't provide one, it's supposed to use the, the platform default. And so to a first approximation, we could change this restriction to only forbid calling number format with an empty argument. Um, unfortunately, it turns out that if you give it a locale that it doesn't have access to, it will simply return the platform default one rather than throwing an exception. Um, yeah, another, an, another thing we could do uh, is to say that uh, as far as the default configuration is concerned, you know, the, safe, the safest configuration is concerned, uh, that um, uh, we, we support exactly the, um, the EN locale because um, uh, one of the GitHub threads uh, clarified that uh, the, the EN locale is the one that's um, de facto supported everywhere. Okay. Um, so Do we have something like C, or is it just EN? Uh, sorry, something like C? The, the C locale, capital C. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's, that's a kind of standard... Um, what, what is capital C locale? It, it, it's the way that you say, I don't want you to translate any of these strings, kind of, sort of. Oh, okay. There, there, there's a special locale that's not supposed to be tied to any human languages. It's tied to the programming language of C. Oh! Oh, oh, oh my god. Um, yeah, so if, uh, basically the criteria is, uh, can we count on its existence on all platforms? that we expect SES to run on um, uh, because uh, if, if we can count on it everywhere, um, then uh, 
uh, something that specifies it without the same everywhere. Yeah. Uh, and it sounds like probably C is universal, I would guess. It, it might be. I've definitely seen cases where um, test unit test cases that need to invoke some other program and parse its output will set an environment variable to set the locale to be C before doing that. So that if you run that test on a machine that's configured for French or Spanish or whatever, you won't wind up with different output from the program that then causes your test to, to fail. Okay. So we so 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 if if both C and E N are universally available, using C as the default probably makes more sense. Yeah, I, I think there are platforms in which C is not available, but okay. we'd have to do some experiments on that. Okay. In any case, I think this is the all the, all the internationalization stuff is comparatively a detail. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the one other uh, internationalization function that we touched is this number format, date format, and one called uh, get default locales that returns a list of locales. Mm -hmm. There's also, did we do anything about time zone? We need to do something about time zone. Um, I think there's something in there for time zone, but we did not do anything with that yet. Okay, so we need to. Um, but in any case, let's, let's, let's go back to the sort of overall how to, how to run CES. So that's do, um, directly giving its strings. Um, uh, how do you, um, when you, you know, have a directory full of JavaScript code that you want to run under CES. Um, so our story for that is not great. Um, so in our playground bat repository that uses CES, um, here's an example of this. The, we've provided a mechanism by which you can uh, evaluate a, a directory full of code into one of the CES compartments. And you do that by setting up an index.js, which is allowed to have imports um, that call in, uh, grab things from other imports. The way that we do that in the playground bat is to use rollup and use the API for rollup to turn this starting point and everything it references into a single string that can be evaluated inside the, the CES realm. So at, at the moment, you know, you, you're on your own for trying to get more than just single strings into a CES compartment, but you can follow the, the pattern that is being done in our playground batch to get more than one thing in there. Um, it's, <clears throat> we still have a lot of work to do on this. Um, we don't have a console.log object in there. In the playground bat, we're able to inject a, an object called log rather than console.log. There's something funny taking place with name conflicts, and when Rollup sees you using Oh, that's too bad. Um, when uh, Rollup sees the code that's being loaded as using console.log, it appears to rewrite that name to avoid conflicts with something else that's in scope at that point. And so we've not yet successfully found a reasonable way of getting the, the traditional console.log to be available to the code that's getting pulled in like this. Um, yeah, so that's as far as we've gotten on that. Obviously, we want to take CES to the point where it can load in multiple modules, and to be able to reason about what a module should be allowed to import, we need to have an API to control a module loader. That's also the point where we want to talk about authority in modules and resource modules and peer modules. So we'll probably wait until we, we nail down some of the module loader syntax before we try and add that into CES. I just wanted to add a thing around console.log. Um, I did it originally import console.log into my Jessica files, but I found I'd rather define a custom log interface and not use all the quirks that console.log has. Um, might be something to consider since console.log may not be available on all platforms. Yeah, yeah. I mean, all, all I really want is that the code that you write that you run in your unit tests and uses console.log as you debug stuff is the same code that you can import into your CES realm. So like having console.log, ha having one, having log or console.log or my special debug log or whatever is fine, but it'd be great if I could use the same thing in both of those environments. Um, just a point about console functions. Um, they're, they're basically uh, made to actually be, um, you can detach them from the console. Like you don't need to say console.log 
you, you don't have to preserve the reference of uh -huh. this being console for them to work. Um, that helps me a lot because I, I export them from a module and whatever I end up um, overriding console log or console warn or whatever, um, I, it basically keeps those references available if I import them uh, from the original uh, exporting module for them. Yeah, we. I, I tried. <clears throat> I think I was depending upon that property um, to be able to provide a log object into the guest code in the playground vat. Um, the particular problem I was running into, I think, was when I tried to provide a console object in there. So just con uh, providing an endowment called console caused roll up or something in that source code rewriting process to see a conflict between the console I was trying to add to it and the console it thought that was already present and so it would rename one of them. So I was able to provide a log function just fine but trying to provide a console a console about anything was running the problems that I couldn't quite do that. Yeah, so so the, the general uh, you know, issue here is that um, roll up is not a packager system that successfully preserves the semantics of the original code. Um, it's doing renamings that uh, it should not be doing. It's doing renamings that are not, uh, you know, that have observable consequences. Um, to note, this is true of all the bundlers I know of if you actually interact with the output source code. I see. Uh, well, that's a terrible shame. Um, uh, there is, um, uh, the MetaMask project, which is a pro project in, as, that's uh, uh, in the um, you know, blockchain ecosystem. It's basically a browser user interface for um, smart contract applications running on Ethereum. Um, so MetaMask, uh, uh, they're using uh, Browserify as their packager. Uh, and they are now, they now have a project called Sessify, um, which is trying to make a uh, Sess module version of Browserify. Um, so I don't know the degree, I don't know, I don't, um, I don't know anything about the, the comparative properties of Browserify as a multi-module packager. Um. Um, one thing to point out about uh, variable renaming in Rollup. Yeah. If you if your variable is imported from a particular module, so let's say I have this module that exports console, and that module is treated as an outside module. It's not part of the like uh, you can figure Rollup to assume that this is an an external module. So if you're importing everything from that particular uh, path for the exporter of console. Um, um, so every single module that uses console starts off by importing console from the same particular location. Then those instances will all refer to the same instance of that console. It only renames when a variable is defined in two separate locations and brought in uh, where it will actually conflict. Um, so, so an exporter, one exporter for console, and everything else that uses console imports console from that one one exporter. That should actually eliminate any uh, duplicate renaming. Okay, I'll start I, with that. Um, go ahead. One problem that I was having there, the all of this playground that code is written as a set of modules um, that has to be stringified and turned into a single string so it can be loaded inside Cess. So the playground that has some code that lives uh, in the primal realm, uh, and that's what gives it access to the network. That's what gives it access to the local disk to um, load and sort state. Define primal realm. Primal realm is the outermost realm that still has the, the host authorities, like require and access to the node standard library. Um, so a functioning application will need to have access to that in order to, to talk to the outside world in some fashion. But most of the code you want to run in a more confined environment. So the playground that consists of some I.O. code sitting out in the primal realm that is made available as endowments 
to carefully written um, uh, code that is that is working for us that is inside the CES realm. That code that's inside the CES realm is then loading and evaluating the untrusted code that the guest of the the VAT um, is. Uh, being loaded into that same environment, but at that point it's safe because we've frozen all the primordials and we're using the safety valve for that. But as a result, a lot of this code is getting stringified and turned into a single string so it can be passed into sys.evaluate. And the code that is trying to define the console that will be made available to the third thing is getting turned into the, the single string second thing. Um, so I, I suspect that something in that in that roll-up process that is seeing the definition of a console, um, and yeah, maybe there are multiple ones. I think I think there was just one, but I wasn't able to track down far enough to pick it. And I just wanted to bring up the point that uh, if we're relying on tooling heuristics, it could be dangerous to fall into a sense of security where we've carefully curated our source tree such that we don't have a collision and then we can accidentally introduce something that does produce a collision. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, that's it. So which packager is Which packager would be the best starting point for creating a packager that we can count on to be semantics preserving in detail? Which semantics are you wishing to preserve? Uh, the, the semantics of the separate files as separate modules uh, importing and exporting to each other according to uh, module semantics, both if they're using ECMAScript modules. I'm sorry? Are you talking about ECMAScript modules? I'm talking about both. Um, uh, so uh, 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 let's, uh, let, well, with regard to this question, let's ask for, you know, both or either. So for any module system, uh, is there a packager that um, uh, is trying to be really careful to be exactly semantics preserving of the module semantics uh, and se would seem to be a good starting point for uh, turning it into a packager that we could have confidence in. Um, for ES modules, rollup is probably the closest. Ah. Um, for common JS, Browserify is uh, not written with the intent you're requesting, but it does match a uh, version of common JS that doesn't have a few features, which are kind of implementation details that are fairly rare for usage. Okay. Uh, um, if, if, so, so if the non-conformance is that it's implementing a subset, and most and most code that we're interested in would be within that subset, uh, that's fine as long as it implements that subset accurately. Uh, to my knowledge, Browserify does fall into that category. Excellent. Um, Rollup is uh, encountering these. Uh, problems because of one of its features that it sells as a boon where it's actually reducing number of scopes allocated yeah. um, and so that's where this renaming is becoming involved I don't know how easy it would be to disable that feature okay. as it is one of its primary selling points I see. but Why? if you can disable it it might make this go away and why do people want to reduce the number of scopes? Uh, it affects uh, performance when you're loading these modules. I see. That seems like a platform bug. There's, there's more scopes in a decent language implementation should not be causing performance degradation. 
Um, well, it, JavaScript, when we compile for the script goal, does not have the same kind of uh, scope topology where you can share a binding between uh, okay. different lexical contexts. Yeah, yeah, the live binding issue. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, uh, so, um, so with regard to stuff that Brian hasn't covered yet, um, for people who are trying to run CES, what, what would be useful to to um, dive into next? So just to confirm, um, if I wanted to import CES as a npm module, I would just do npm install, and then I could import it as a common JS. Yeah. For, okay, and, and I I don't have to do any of the. Um, uh, npm dash r esm stuff. Um, that's a good question. I think you do still have to do that. Um, because this is all still a bunch of individual files. Yeah, I think you still need that. Yeah, that looks familiar. Um, uh, which means that you actually do have to npm install ESM as well. Does that mean that ESM isn't right now a dependency of sets? Maybe we have it marked as a build dependency and not as a, a, a runtime one. Oh, OK. Yeah, we should probably move that over. Okay. Right, I'll make a note for that. Let's take it. And uh, somebody was mentioning earlier that there's also an experimental modules option on Node. Uh, yeah, you said that, that was getting deprecated, right? Um, that will eventually uh, uh, be replaced by the actual implementation. So when that happens, um, it will be deprecated. Mm -hmm. um, the actual implementation is potentially going to be uh, very different in terms of how you uh, create a loader. So, uh, just to interject here, the the reason why experimental modules did not work is that the require keyword is not accessible to Node when you use that feature. Oh, it makes it modules and not require. Yes, you have to use import and then wow. a file name. Oh, wow. wow. Okay. You could also uh, node introduced uh, uh, an export from the module module, um, and uh, that's uh, create require function. Uh, it creates a require function. It's a very very uh, crude way for now to use an ES in, in order for you to create a require function relative to a particular path, and then use that to resolve all, all your requires if you want. But. To be clear, uh, the modules working group is not currently trying to introduce a uh, lexical binding for require into their upcoming implementation. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, another issue that uh, came up before Bradley joined that um, uh, Bradley be a, a good person to um, uh, to, re to react to is uh, Sala was saying that um, uh, there's a significant performance cost on node for evaluating code within a created VM context as opposed to evaluating it directly uh, that seems strange Yeah, so uh, can I uh, phrase that a bit differently? Uh, like nine months ago, when I was doing testing between uh, a shimmed realm and uh, a VM context to try to see how, uh, you know, where, where the performance benefits of creating a realm as a shim can actually come. Um, um, the shim was a lot faster compared to evaluating the same loop inside a context. 
So, um, so it was not the creation of the context that was creating the concern for me, but rather if I throw evals against a context that already ha exists, that that code seems to be running a bit slower. Um, so I haven't really looked into uh, whether that was just a temporary thing at the time, um, but it was something that I would like to keep in mind uh, down the road uh, with a little bit more testing. Uh, if there is a significant performance problem, it should be classified as a bug. It's the only thing. Okay, so you so you agree that there's no good reason for there to to remain a any performance penalty for for running inside a created context. Uh, um, unless you're passing through to evaluators manually, there shouldn't be. But I can believe that there are performance okay. problems right okay. now. Okay. So uh, let's see. Uh, were you? Was there a remaining thing that? No. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Unless I mean, if people have questions, I'll do what I can. But I can't think of anything else to show. What? Uh, what about uh, uh, the type of performance uh, degradation? Are we talking about ten percent? Are we talking about two times? What, what's the what's the sense of the perf difference? Like I, I recall when I was um, when I was testing, like it was it was definitely um, closer to two and sometimes more. But but again, I wasn't really doing um, you know fine grain testing to actually measure this. I was just seeing it as you know as I was testing the performance of the shim, not the actual context. So um, again, you know, like I, I think the fair thing to to take out of this is. Um, we should just keep it in mind and come up with a way to explore that uh, if we're going to use context um, as the you know go-to approach. Um, just verify that. Um, I did not really uh, scientifically <laughs> you know try to document yeah. it in any yeah. way, but it was an observation that that you know um, I, I was kind of actually feeling good for a couple of days, you know, like looking at the times. Uh, but then, um, you know, it wasn't really uh, done to um, document this. Well, that's in, that's interesting. Um, have you know Have you noticed any difference um, inside the shim versus outside the shim without a um, a VM? Um, my shim was completely different than what we're doing here. It was the bare okay. bones of that. Um, I, I was basically looking at ways to get rid of particular hooks like uh, has, um, would always return false, stuff like that. So, so I was really playing around with that concept of object context, which is actually a proxy, and how you can make that faster uh, by taking shortcuts you can get away with. So, okay. and, and that should also be a, a very um, important thing to note about whether um, the performance difference that I was seeing is justifiable um, because I was really trying to optimize the shim, right? So, yeah, yeah. yeah we, we, I'm mentioning, I'm questioning because uh, what few things we do in order to um, evaluate the, what, how good or valuable or how production ready the code is, uh, we ran it through various test suite, and one of the test suites we've been looking at was Jetstream, um, and so those are different standard tests. Um, mostly around a mathematical computation, but we noticed that, and the thing, it, it's still puzzling us um, why, and, and we got onto that suite, one of the reasons was to compare Kaha and, 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 the, and the Realm uh, Shim uh, to have an idea of, um, did we achieve anything in terms of, of, um, of, of performance with, uh, with the quality of the code? And um, we notice that the shim is faster than Kaha. Uh, Kaha has a, if you go to their test page, they have run a few uh, of those uh, jet stream examples that it verbatim copied there. Uh, and Jay, uh, would it be useful uh, to be projecting something to illustrate? No, you? no, I don't. I'm not projecting, but we, we could. Like you could go to that page, that Kaha page, and and, and you know um, 
and run those tests. And when we run the same test in the browser and in the shim, um, we get that uh, for most tests, the shim is faster than uh, running the test naked in the browser. And it's still puzzling us. We still, still don't know. It's not, a lot, it's not like two times. But we get about, uh, depending on the test, uh, about a 10% uh, difference. 10%, and we don't know what it was. 10% faster in the shim than in the naked browser. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, are these what? tests that touch global variables? Yes. Well, they touch not global variables. They touch global objects like math and things like that. Okay. But not... Do they, um, Okay, interesting. So, quick question there. Uh, are they shimmed? Uh, are they stored inside a constant uh, somewhere within your shim and, and accessible through that or accessible through actually piercing through the shim? Well, uh, well actually, we, uh, created, we create the realm and then uh, we just run realm evaluate and the test runs. So when you, when you do the evaluate, the, you know, the, the eight magic lines of code uh, one of them is the uh, substitution hole uh, for doing the optimize, where the... Yes, exactly. Uh, so the optimize does create uh, co lexical const bindings for all the global variables that, that mm -hmm. are, 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 do not vary. Correct. Uh, yeah. that, so m could that be the reason why you have the speed up? Yeah, now uh, that, that you think of it, it could be a test that we could do. We could run in the naked browser with a that const line if this even uh, does anything. I can verify it is because I tried it because I, I was actually very, very like when I saw the code for the consts, I was like, oh yeah, that's how you do it. That's how you make code run fast. So it clicked and I played around with that concept. When you do that constant declaration at the top of your code, um, it actually uh, eliminates the um, time it takes to go through the prototype of uh, the window proxy. Oh, right. right. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, it, it actually helps even in any function if you create constants, as long as your function you know, is worthy of a variable. Um, constants in there definitely, uh, if, you, if you're going to refer to the same en entry you know, a couple of times, um, especially if you're not using Chrome, uh, I think Chrome does that automatically in um, you know subsequent optimizations of functions, um, but other browsers don't. Well, I I think that um, I mean all right. One one of the things that I've seen over and over again uh, is that you'll get much more adoption if you can offer people a three percent speed up uh, rather than offering people a life-saving life increment in security. <laughs> Very good. So, so the fact that, that you know, right. we, we do have a speed-up here, even if it's a speed-up they could reproduce manually with a small number of lines of code, they don't need to reproduce it manually. They can just use SES. Optimize instead of uh, correctness. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'll just caution from a, a, a PR and marketing perspective. Let's make sure that SES itself does not get like hacked. Because <laughs> you know, if if everybody puts security on one point, um, it it really has to not give in. Well, so uh, that is the goal here: is to get to the point. We're not there yet, but to get to the point where we are recommending that people use SES for security critical things and at Salesforce um, uh, so when I say we're not there yet we're not there yet with regard to the CES and the public repository uh, and that's because of, of three outstanding um, uh, pieces of security engineering that we haven't moved into the public repository uh, yet um, uh, uh, there's, those are listed as, as uh, security bugs on the SES issue tracker uh, but Salesforce is using SES uh, in a security critical way in production supporting 5 million developers uh, and they've got bug bounties out on Hacker One. Yeah, and, uh, and, um, and uh, our experience over the past uh, two years has been gradually better, especially over the past year since we uh, started to collaborate more closely with SES. And uh, now for the new Lightning um, uh, 
web component framework that just been released in December, um, you cannot disable that security feature. It's people have to live with it. So we set the bar really high um, and that people have to run inside SES and inside of our other um, security um, membranes, uh, which are very similar to Domato in concept, but very different in implementation, but still. Um, we set the bar really high. We're pretty, uh, pretty glad with the performance and the um, security um, uh, properties of it. Uh, we've especially the um, evaluation aspect or the realm aspect has so far resisted um, crossing our fingers yeah. uh, attempts by uh, a lot of security reviewers to uh, go through it. Yeah. Also, uh, SES itself has the demo page, uh, which has um, uh, three public three public bugs or three public winners of the challenge. Uh, two of which are are uh, um, uh, uh, happened at the same time by one person. Um, uh, but uh, all of those are low impact with regard to the overall security um, uh, uh, goals of CESS. So with regard to those three discovered flaws, uh, uh, had there been production use of CESS uh, before those flaws were discovered, an attacker using those flaws uh, would not have been able to compromise much. Although they would have been able to, uh, although they you know they were able to win the um, side channel challenge, uh, side channels are really hard. Uh, the attempt to plug side channels is probably going to remain an especially delicate security property, and was not a claim that is um, relevant to the integrity properties of CES. Uh, which is where I expect most of the usage to be. Uh, and also, I'll just mention, uh, you know, Google's been using um, uh, Kaha with the, with the earlier version of CES um, uh, in production and supporting other developers using in production in security critical ways for many, many years. Um, sorry, could could we get a, a link to the site, the SES site? Because I've, I've been trying yeah. to look for um, that, and I don't don't know where to actually go. Oh, from the um, the GitHub repository from the README, there should be a link to that challenge page. Uh, okay. Yeah, Thanks. I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, post a um, thing in the chat in a moment here. So that is the actual challenge page. And then that is the SES uh, GitHub repository. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, with regard to how confident we are in the security of CES, uh, I should also mention that um, uh, that if the underlying JavaScript engine has, um, uh, for example, memory unsafety bugs that can be exploited from vanilla JavaScript, uh, then they likely can be exploited from vanilla CES. Uh, so so um, bugs in the underlying JavaScript engine uh, can compromise the security of running CES on that JavaScript engine. Uh, so that's, that's why Agoric 
for the high security uses of CES, including CES running on public blockchains, uh, is planning to run it on XS rather than running it on uh, a JavaScript engine that has been uh, optimized for speed and incorporates a complex JIT. Uh, complex JITs are, are you know, the, from what I've seen, um, no complex JIT has been engineered in such a way that there are good grounds for being very confident that the JIT is uh, exactly semantics preserving. I, found, I saw some really interesting bugs about that um, just a couple of weeks ago that was talking about a version of Chromium from a few months back that had a confusion between positive zero and negative zero hmm. in the way that the JIT uh, compared those versus the way the regular runtime code used that. Wow. And they actually built a capture the flag um, puzzle surrounding that one that one issue. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Um, uh, so I think at this point, what I'd like to do is uh, switch to uh, Kate's manifest and talk through um, uh, using that, we, we, um, uh, what needs to be changed in a module system so that we can drive it from that manifest to create a, um, a module system useful for CES. Mark, does this still need to be recorded? Uh, no, no. Or uh, if nobody minds, I can. St I could also record that. But we can. What I should do is I should stop this recording and then start it up again. If uh, well, let me let me stop this one and then we can discuss whether to start a new one. Hmm. Oh, there it is.